Tonight, we are thrilled to welcome Tatiana Schlossberg in celebration of her new book, Inconspicuous Consumption, The Environmental Impact You Don't Know That You Have. She is joined in conversation tonight by KUOW's Ross Reynolds. Tatiana Schlossberg is a journalist writing about climate change and the environment. She previously reported on these subjects for the science and climate sections of the New York Times, where she also worked on the Metro desk. Her work has also appeared in the Atlantic, Bloomberg View, The Record in Bergen County, and the Vineyard Gazette. She lives in New York. Just a few more announcements before we get started. Books are on the queue behind you. You can purchase them at any register downstairs. The store does close at 7, but we are free to stay here for the duration of the event. We will keep a register open for 15 minutes after the event if you still need to make purchases. Now, please join me in welcoming Tatiana Schlossberg and Ross Reynolds. Well, thanks so much for coming out this evening on the eve of the great climate strike, which is taking place tomorrow. It's a very auspicious time to be talking about our role in the climate. <coughs> um, news outlets. You may not have noticed it, but many news outlets around the country, including KUOW, are focusing on Climate Week this week with lots of incredible reporting. And just today in the news, the New York Times had an incredible report. The number of birds in the United States and Canada has declined by 3 billion, or 29%, over the last half century. Kind of a shocking number to see. KUOW's Eilish O'Neill has been reporting on dead trees found in a half a million acres of Washington State. And then, as I mentioned, the climate strike taking place tomorrow, so this is very much of the moment. And also of the moment, Tatiana, I'd like to start out with some news today. Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos says the company is committed to meet the terms of the Paris Climate Agreement 10 years ahead of schedule. He's talked about moving to 100% renewable energy, including buying 100,000 electric vans. And I know part of your book deals with the imprint of our electronic life. Um, this is just the day before Amazon workers, 1,400, are scheduled to walk off the job as part of the climate strike. So which, should we be impressed by Jeff Bezos' action? Um, oh, well, first of all, thank you all so much for coming. And I'm always shocked to see that people I don't know want to listen to me talk. So um, it's very nice that you're all here. Um, I, you know, Amazon is one of the only of these big, it's the only one of these big five tech companies, um, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon, and I don't know if I can't remember the fifth one, but anyway, they don't release any information about their carbon footprint. Um, so until they do that, um, and until we know more about how they're planning to be 100% renewable, whether that's building their own renewable facilities, you know, incur um, entering into partnerships with utilities to make sure that additional renewable capacity is built instead of just buying uh, renewable energy credits or purchasing offsets, I think uh, we should be slightly skeptical. Um, but I do think, um, you know, any any company kind of taking the initiative to do this is important and should be lauded. But as consumers, we have a responsibility to make sure that it's actually meaningful. Um, and you here in Seattle are in the best position to do that. So, uh, the subtitle of your book, "The Environmental Impact You Don't Know You Have." How do you know what people don't know? <laughs> well, I didn't know any of it, so I guess I'm taking myself as a representative sample, but. Um, so I, I wrote about the internet, food, fashion, and fuel, and um, you know the, the hidden and unconscious impacts of our all, much of our stuff um, in that area, but how it connects to the global climate crisis and how each one of us is participating in these systems, um, you know that lead to pollution and waste and more consumption without our even being aware of it. But I um, so I, I don't. I guess it's a very um, philosophical question of how do, you, how do you even know what you know? Um, but um, I tried to sort of, you know, um, learn about these different systems and, um, and you know, try to figure out sort of how were they, how, are the, how was consumption changed even in, you know, my lifetime without me thinking about it based on things like, you know, convenience and, um, you know, the role of the internet in so many of our lives and, and what do those things actually mean and how does the scale um, of these systems uh, lead to these problems. Well, you've been out with the book for a little while now. You're, you're talking to your audience. What kind of things are they telling you they did not know until you, they were able to read your book? Um, I think most people are really surprised to hear about the environmental impact of the internet um, in terms of both the electricity consumption and um, also uh, e-waste, what happens to our stuff, which is so I read about the internet in the book and also technology. 
Um, but really, you know, the so the internet uses about one to two percent of global electricity. It's two to three percent of um, global greenhouse gas emissions, which is about the same as the shipping industry. Um, but I think because we often talk about it as the cloud and it's wireless and it's our phones and it, you know we don't necessarily think of that it is part of this incredibly um, tangible system that is using electricity all the time in case we want to uh, watch Netflix in our sleep uh, or order <laughs> something online. Um, and I think also um, I was really surprised to learn about the impacts of the fashion industry. Um, and I think most people seem, I mean there are some aspects of it that I was aware of that I think people are aware of like fast fashion. But understanding the scale of that system and then the impacts um, in some of the other areas, I read about denim, for instance, and how much water it uses. It seems like people are are surprised to learn those things because I think we think of our clothing, or at least I do, as something very personal and intimate and hard to imagine connecting to this, you know, global international system. But um, your know, clothing has been one of the engines and drivers of um, globalization. So it's um, so it it is and learning about all, how all that fits together has been really fascinating for me and I think for readers as well. I gotta say, I was using my PS4 to stream video and I read that section <laughs> of your book and I went, oops, <laughs> and immediately went out and changed that up to use a less energy intensive way of watching streaming video. Um, are you, have you changed your habits at all from the research you did on this book? Um, I have. I think one of the points that I try to make in the book is that, um, you know, even though I wrote a book about all of our stuff and the things we use all the time. Um, you know, personal behavior, uh, well, the, the narrative of personal responsibility in the conversation about around climate change, I think, has been really destructive um, because it's made us all feel guilty and ashamed and then to kind of turn inward and look at ourselves instead of kind of thinking about, um, uh, you know, how, how our society works so in, that allows these things to happen. So I don't think we should feel individually guilty um, but I think we should feel collectively responsible for building a better world and for fixing these systems. That being said, um, well, and, and also, you know, focusing on individual responsibility lets those who are actually responsible off the hook, and that's fossil fuel companies and politicians and um, lobbyists and um, and people who are you know, standing in the way of progress. And so the the most important way for all of us to change our behavior is to vote and to get involved in the political process. Um, and also to put pressure on um, companies that aren't, at the very least, being transparent about their practices and um, then hopefully making an effort to improve them. But I, I have changed my behavior because I, not because I'm under any illusions that you know, me bringing my own bag to the grocery store is going to fix this problem, but because I want to be the kind of person who lives in line with my values and um, you know, acts on the things that I learned. So um, I try to just consume less is kind of what that has meant for me. Um, I mean, you know, especially with clothes, which has made it very difficult to figure out what to wear in my book tour. Um, <laughs> but I got two new outfits and wearing them out. Um, and but yeah, to you know, to be kind of conscious of my impacts to you know not order online if I don't have to. And I live in New York, so I can walk to a store. Um, and you know, not eating as much red meat if I have to travel, uh, offsetting that. And not because I think that that's enough, but because I want to be that kind of person. You don't want people to feel guilty, but you do end the book by saying, if the reader is upset, you did something right. Yes. <laughs> so have you encountered readers on this tour who have been upset yes. in the way you wanted them to be? Um, well, I think it, you know, it is, it's the, pro the climate crisis is deeply upsetting because it feels, um, I think, really big and really inevitable. And um, as individuals, we feel powerless against um, all these global systems that contribute to it. And so um, I think confronting that is, is really upsetting and thinking about how the things we you know, didn't give a second thought to have you know, um, used up precious water supply in you know, Uzbekistan, for instance, or you know, added driving miles to the road when we were just uh, taking an Uber. Um, so I, I, I understand that that's upsetting, but I, I hope that people read my book and I guess how, how I felt after writing it and after becoming a climate reporter is that I, it's not that I feel that the problem is less serious and less scary, but that I feel more in control. I feel like a more responsible and informed citizen because I can understand, you know, if Amazon makes that kind of announcement, I can understand what that means. Or, you know, a politician pr proposes a policy 
I can evaluate it independently. And so, um, you know, that, that makes me feel um, slightly more in control, although um, difficult to feel, <laughs> to feel that way, really, at all. Well, you write that the, the narrative personal responsibility, as you mentioned, for the climate change is destructive. But isn't it kind of necessary to at least recognize it in your personal life if you're going to be motivated to try to change it in public life? Yeah, I do think it's necessary, and that's you know I, that's why I wrote the book. I just I don't want people to, you know, eat one less hamburger and think that that's enough, um, or um, you know think that what they're doing alone is where this um, problem, where addressing this problem ends. And really, we have to. Um, unless we understand these systems, we, unless we understand what the problems are, we won't be able to solve them. And so that was really the goal in writing this book, is to um, show how all of these problems are connected and how all these systems work together. And that, um, you know, for eating less meat to have um, a great impact in terms of reducing emissions, we have to reform a system that, you know, means that 90 million acres of land grow to, or better example, that 67% of crop calories in the U.S. don't feed people, they feed animals. And um, and so even if I eat one less hamburger, it doesn't change that. But understanding, you know, where where my consumption fits into that and, and how, and that those systems need to be changed, I think is really important. You mentioned that uh, you're, you were, uh, came from talking to Governor Inslee before you came here, and Governor Inslee ran for president on climate change as a major part of his platform, changing climate change. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about your conversation with him? Well, I wrote to him. I um, I wrote to him because I was coming to Seattle, and um, I've never been here before. Um, but I I really admired um, his campaign and his dedication to this issue, and I think that he really did elevate the conversation. And so um, we spoke about that. We spoke about some of the things that are happening in Washington State. He mentioned a waste to energy plant that opened yesterday, um, and a pumped hydro storage plant. So. Um, you know, I think if you read my book, you'll see that um, I rarely meet a detail that I don't like, and it seems like Governor Inslee is, um, <laughs> shares, shares that love of wonky detail. So um, we were mostly just talking about climate stuff. So. I don't know how closely you've looked at the candidate stands and their initiatives on climate, but do you have any impressions on one that stands out? Well, his really stood out, um, you know, in addition to. Um, I think you know having uh, expressing some of the most important overall goals. It really um, and and big ideas really got into the nitty gritty. Um, and something that, in particular, I really liked about it was the way that he talked about zoning, which I think is something many of us probably don't think about as being involved in the fight against climate change at all. But you know, if we're gonna, if people can't live and work in the same place. They're gonna have to be relying on transportation, and usually that means a car. And so without you know, changing those, our density patterns and where we live and where we work, we can't move away from you know, personal dependence on the automobile. So that, that sort of stuff I really liked. Um, I did just mention I'm into wonky details, in case that's not clear. Um, but uh, I, I was really excited to see that Senator Warren had adopted um, several of his policies. And I, I think you know, whoever the nominee is should, should do that as well. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about those four areas that your book focuses in on. Internet and technology, that's one, food, fashion, and fuel. As you mentioned, the internet and technology contributes about two to three percent of carbon emissions. Now, of course, every bit counts, but that sounds like a real small percentage. Why be concerned? Um, it is a real small percentage, and I'm you know, careful to say in the book that you know, it's by no means the greatest emitter or sort of the, the most important thing to worry about. But I think the fact that you know I didn't know about it, that I hadn't even considered it, and I think that so many other people haven't really thought about it at all is really important. And also, the rate at which the internet is growing and how much we're using data means that if we're not paying attention to this, so I think by um, you know 2024, um, the internet could use as much as 20 is projected to use as much as 24 percent of global electricity, um, and so it's really important to. Um, you know, ensure that companies are improving efficiency, which which they are, and they're really good at. But also that um, that they're installing renewable capacity and trying to find solutions for some of the problems. Um, you know, they can't. I mean, even if they're running on renewable energy, which I write about in the book, they also use diesel generators as backup, and that's a big problem here in Washington State in um, Quincy, where there are tons of data centers from Microsoft and others. And Microsoft applied this 
or a year ago or two for 70, I think, diesel backup generators. Um, and that, I mean, burning diesel fuel at all is not good <laughs> for climate, but um, I think we should be making sure that they're, that they're making efforts to, um, to improve those systems. And if we aren't paying attention, that, that won't happen. We mentioned maybe not shopping online, maybe instead of shopping online, just going to a local store, which is easy in New York City and many places in Seattle, but not everywhere. But are there other ideas you have for kind of reducing our use of the internet? So I, and, um, I wanted to write about e-commerce um, in particular because I felt that there had been a lot of hand wringing about all the cardboard coming into our homes and that you know everyone's like, oh, I feel so guilty I ordered this thing online. And I wanted to find out if you know, those things actually were worse for the environment or not. It turns out that, you know, over the last decade, uh, e-commerce has quadrupled, but the rate of, or cardboard production has stayed relatively flat. Um, and the transport, these logistics companies like FedEx and UPS are much better at planning a delivery route than we are at figuring out how to go to the store. So the average um, car trip to go buy something is seven miles. Um, and, but these companies, I mean, because fuel is one of their, Basic um, expenses really, you know, try to figure out how to, um, you know, consume less and uh, keep their their costs down. But we ruin all of that with things like two day and overnight shipping because then um, their systems become less efficient. Because you know, in order to get me the thing in time, a truck may have to go out um, half empty or half full, depending on how you look at it. Um, but uh, so. I think part of the part of the issue with all of these things is this the scale at which they're used and, and how we use them because e-commerce isn't necessarily a problem in terms of um, emissions or electricity or energy use but when we kind of distort how it's intended to be used that's where some problems arise so um, that's one example I think um, devices themselves are incredibly um, energy and energy and resource intensive to produce. Um, you know, your smartphone contains like 40 metals and rare earth materials. Um, and, you know, companies rely on us wanting a new one before the one that we have is, um, uh, you know, ready to be disposed of. So I think, you know, understanding what, what these things are made of and the, I mean, both the environmental and the human cost of making them is really important and hopefully will make us value these things more. But also the companies that produce these things um, you know, they have, or they should feel a responsibility to make sure that, you know, we can return them easily, that they can be recycled, um, because otherwise we're just going to have to keep mining for um, metals and other materials. And um, so I think, you know, keeping things for longer, making sure you dispose of them responsibly, and also, um, you know, incur um, supporting companies or that um, are interested in, uh, you know, reclaiming materials for future use. How about just the use of the computer? I mean, you can see you wrote this yeah, book yeah, on the yeah, computer. You, yeah, right. You can I mean, use your computer less. <laughs> the people who think a lot and work in the knowledge industry spend all day on the computer. I don't know any way around that, is there? Um, I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, I think that um, that's sort of how our world works now. And, um, you know, there are certainly efficiency gains associated with, you know, um, doing research online or, um, you know, producing material online versus producing paper and things like that. It just depends at, you know, at what point are, are those gains outweighed by how much more we're using um, our computers, especially with things like video. Um, but I think, you know, our, we're only projected to use the internet more and to use more data with things like AI and cryptocurrency and self-driving cars. And so that's why it's so important to, um, I think, to make sure that the the way that we're using, or the, the sources of electricity, um, you know, are, are renewably powered. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about cryptocurrency because you say that we might not think of, be, think of that as being immaterial, but actually that's a huge mm -hmm. use of energy going into that. Yeah, so um, I, some people may have um, read about how much uh, data and electricity is used in Bitcoin mining uh, in particular. And um, a lot of that is happening in China, but it's also happening, um, which means that it's uh, more likely powered by coal. Um, some of it's happening in you know in other parts of the world. I write about a data center in Iceland where some Bitcoin mining is taking place. I think though, um, you know, I have been. I, I think it's important to keep all these things in mind 
But I think sometimes that that's a distraction from a conversation about resource use and electricity because it's not as if the global banking industry doesn't use electricity and resources and metal and linen and you know um, keeping lights on in banks 24 hours a day and pens on chains. Um, so, uh, um, so I think it's you know we also have to. Um, I think usually when you hear like something is really bad, sometimes it's true, but there are always trade-offs, um, and this is a, I think an example of that. The most useless use of energy, as is, is you get into quite a bit, is vampire power. And you cite a study of homes in Northern California showing that a quarter of residential energy, energy was used when the devices were off or in the standby mode. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so um, I think um, when we think, for many of our devices, we think that they, we've turned them off successfully. Um, but often we haven't, and, or they still draw energy even when we have turned them off. Um, and you know, as we get, um, as our devices increasingly have Wi-Fi connections, that means that they're on all the time because they have to be on to receive a signal, or something has a clock, or it has a light. Um, you know, those things. It, it, each one is only a little bit of electricity, but it, you know, something like three quarters of all of our appliances are drawing power even when we're not using them. And some of them use, um, you know, like a, a cable box can use as much electricity when it's on as when it's off. Um, and I think you know those are things that don't even kind of enter um, our our minds when we're thinking about um, you know how how we use those things in our electricity. And so um, so I, yeah, so that was another thing I was really surprised to learn. And I did a lot of testing of my own appliances, um, and also went over to friends' houses and uh, tested theirs. And um, just a word to the wise: people don't love when you go over to their house and unplug all their appliances. But um, you know, I had to do it for the book, so. <laughs> I gotta say, there's a little war in my household about that. One of us wants to unplug everything all the time, and the other one of us doesn't want to. Well, yeah, because then you have to reset the clock. And exactly. Then... <laughs> all right. So you got to pick your battles, I guess. Um, I, I want to turn to the second big source of, of energy use and climate change, and that's food. Farmers market or grocery store? I've heard arguments for both. That grocery stores, because of the scale of mass food, actually use less energy. What's your thoughts on what you find out about that? Um, I don't. I don't know in, t in terms of the energy use. Um, I would imagine you know y you could probably make the argument either way that like having lots of trucks come from farms into the you know wherever the farmers market is rather than having one truck make a big delivery. Um, and I wrote about um, you know food miles as a, um, in the books because I felt like I had used I used to hear a lot about that and how important it was to buy local food. Um, but I wanted to know if that was really true. And transportation is a very small part of, um, of the emissions associated with producing food, and that's because producing food wastes a ton of energy and is really inefficient. Um, so transportation proportionally is very small. But it w I was very interested to learn that um, you have to be really, really, really good at buying food locally in order for that to make as big of a difference as just shifting your protein source you know, away from meat one day a week. Um, and so, you know, I think it's important to support farmers who use sustainable practices and, you know, eating locally, eating seasonally. Um, I mean, those things are, are all good, but I think it's just a, a sign of how off the whole system is that, you know, it could be using less energy to import something from Mexico than it would be to grow it down the street. Um, and so, you know, even though that, that might be true, um, you know, it's, I don't want to accept, um, the status quo there, you know, that doesn't that doesn't really make sense. You know, I've read about the um, the fact that we put so many subsidies into corn, and so much of corn is turned into sweetener, which is not exactly great for your diet. But you kind of talk about corn also from the environmental impact. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about that? Yeah, I um I I think um probably lots of people have heard about you know how um, impactful meat production is um, in terms of climate change and livestock alone is responsible for 15% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and, but I wanted to, um, I think I wanted to talk about those impacts in another way because I think, you know, we've heard about, heard about that a lot. And some people also have heard about corn a lot, but I, um, I was really interested in particular in the um, impacts of fertilizer. Um, and so, you know, fertilizer runoff um, can lead to things like um, 
toxic algae blooms in um, the ocean and in lakes, and um, but also causes rural drinking water pollution uh, in terms of you know how the nitrates um, seep into the soil, and you know people in um, corn country um, suffer from that disproportionately to people in other places, and um, I think it's. You know the the companies that make the fertilizer, the um, you know industrial livestock feed producers, they're not paying for the costs associated with that. Whether it's you know the health effects of rural drinking water pollution, or it's you know the, the livelihood of a shrimp fisherman in the Gulf of Mexico, um, and so but you know we pay for those things in terms of healthcare costs, um, you know water quality, um, and so I think it's a it's a powerful example of how um, you know we've kind of been mortgaging. Um, the environmental costs of so much of our consumption, and, and that those who are responsible really should be should be paying for those things. I think another product, one of the revelations of the um, 1419 series was how the cotton economy relied so much on slavery, and how it really became embedded into our entire economy that way. But you take it from the angle of its influence on the environment. Could you talk about that? <clears throat> yeah. So. Um, I wrote about, um, I wanted to write about cotton, and the way that I did that was writing about denim production because I think um, we, or I anyway, um, take denim as like, you know, this kind of classic American material, and um, and I wanted to understand it because I think we think of it as, you know, everyday and not necessarily precious. Um, but basically, um, cotton, depending on where it's grown, um, but on, on average uses about uh, it uses, takes um, like 2,500 gallons of water to produce one kilogram of cotton. So that's like two pounds. And then it can take an additional 2,000, uh, up to 2,900 gallons to turn it into a single pair of blue jeans. Um, and I was really astounded by that water use because it, I had never heard anything about that. Um, and, you know, cotton is often grown in places without a lot of water to begin with. Um, and, you know, a lot of the places that are producing the denim you know, in China and Vietnam, they're, um, you know, not recycling the water. Water gets out of the factories. It's incredibly polluted with the chemicals that are used to dye blue jeans. Um, and so it, it seemed like this whole kind of other world um, of denim that, that, I, that I didn't know about. But um, people get really upset about that, <laughs> about how bad they feel now that they own denim. Um, but I think it's, it's really important to, for us um, I think the people who are responsible for that are the people who make the blue jeans. And it's almost impossible if you're standing in the store for a consumer to figure out which pair of blue jeans use the least amount of water to produce. And so it really should be on the companies to um, you know, be transparent about their practices and then also try to focus on using a lot less water. And some companies do that. Um, you know, Levi's has a water less campaign and they've made that technology available to others in the industry. But I think it's... Um, I, th I, th I thought that was um, incredibly interesting and um, something that I hadn't heard about before. You're right, synthetic fabrics use less <coughs> water, but... <laughs> but um, synthetic fabrics are made of oil, um, which I think is kind of hard to think about when, I mean, it's hard to feel like the, the t-shirt that you're wearing or what you're exercising in is made of petrochemicals, but, um, but it is, and it can use, it uses producing polyester alone, which is the most common Synthetic fiber um, results in the emissions of the equivalent of 185 coal-fired power plants every year. Um, but the the problem that that I focused on in the book was that, um, and I think more people are are learning about this, but that um, the fibers from these fabrics can escape through our washing machines and end up um, going to wastewater treatment plants, um, and then either they kind of settle into the sludge of the wastewater treatment plant, which is then used as fertilizer. And so um, these small pieces of plastic can get into, you know, not only our food and water supply, but, you know, elsewhere in the environment. And the fibers can also escape through the wastewater treatment plants to, um, you know, ocean or rivers. And, you know, they, they're they pretty good at stopping that from happening, but, if, you know, they process millions and millions of gallons every day. And so um, some scientists think that microfiber plastic pollution, which is not only from textiles, but that represents like about 30%, um, is the most abundant source of pollution on Earth. Yep, yep.
up your water for you. Oh, thank you. My impossible water. <laughs> um, another aspect of fashion is that fashion demands new fashion, which means getting rid of old fashion. Um, what's the impact of those clothes that people don't want anymore? Um, well, I think, you know, uh, especially with company, with fast fashion companies um, and us and clothing being so cheap, we think of it as disposable. And um, the average item of clothing is worn seven times before it's thrown away. Um, but it, you know, took a tremendous amount of resources to produce that, whether that's oil or cotton um, or, you know, wool or whatever it is that it's made of, not to mention the human labor costs associated with that. So, and then um, in the U.S., only about 15% of textiles um, end up being recycled, either donated or, um, you know, usually textiles are downcycled, so they're made into, like, rags or insulation, that sort of thing. But 85% end up in a landfill, and if it's, um, you know, cotton or another natural fiber, it releases methane. If it's synthetic fiber, it doesn't biodegrade, but it can leach chemicals like plasticizers into the environment. So um, I think we all have to, I, th I mean, I think that, you know, the, the reason that these clothes are so cheap is because nobody's paying for the cost of producing them, whether it's shipping them, you know, here from China or not paying for the water pollution or, you know, not that they're not being a carbon tax on the production of polyester, all these different things make our clothes cheap, but obviously they, they do cost something. It's just that nobody's paying for that. Um, and so, um, so I think we have to, you know, again, be putting pressure on the companies to be more responsible, but also um, you not think of these things as disposable and, you know, try to value the things that we have. And so when I was saying before that I try to consume less, um, I, I mean, I try to value my clothes to, you know, wear the things that I have and wear them out, um, as opposed to kind of always getting new things. And um, so I, uh, yeah, so I think we kind of have to reorient ourselves in terms of the value of, of the things that we have. Um, you end the book by talking about fuel, which is often where books like this begin. Um, what kind of things were you able to uncover about fuel that we might not be aware of? Um, well, I wanted to write about fuel last because uh, I do think, you know, we hear about it so much and also because it's usually really boring. Uh, so I didn't want people to pick up the book and think, oh no, another boring book about fuel. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to buy this. So, um, so I, I ended the book that way and I think also a lot of the um, issues that are, you know, discussed previously make it um, easier to understand. Um, one of the issues that I wrote about in the book, which I, um, which is really important, and um, is coal ash, which is the byproduct of burning coal for electricity. And um, I had never heard about coal ash before I became a climate and environment reporter, um, even though in 2008, um, oh, so, so basically coal ash, it, you know, it contains mercury, arsenic, lead, cadmium, all kinds of other harmful substances and what happens is um, usually it's stored in water so it will be flushed out of a power plant um, in water and then stored kind of in dammed off sections of rivers and lakes um, where it can uh, seep into the groundwater or end up um, you know in, in those lakes and rivers and um, in 2008 uh, one of these dams that was holding back this toxic sludge um, broke and released millions billions of gallons of this substance into a river in Tennessee and buried 300 acres of land there with this um, toxic material. And it's one of the largest environmental disasters in American history. I had never heard about it uh, and it only happened 10 years ago. And, um, you know, but it, it also is a problem every day and for, for people who live near these facilities and those people are disproportionately um, non-white, rural, and low-income communities. And the fact that I had never heard about coal ash as a privileged white person living in a city is part of the problem. Um, because I think we are so distant from the effects of, of our consumption, whether it's electricity or something else, that we don't think about the waste. But you know, somebody who's living next to this power plant, I mean, they have no choice but to know what coal ash is and also to suffer the health consequences associated with having it in the environment. And so, um, that is a, a topic that um, most people, I think, don't don't know about. It's also a topic that 
so I also do freelance journalism and I pitch so many collage stories and nobody ever wants them. Um, so it's not a subject that um, people necessarily are interested in, but I think it's incredibly important and really interesting because you know, it's one of the largest solid industrial waste streams in the US. We still produce more than 100 million tons of it every year. 30% of our electricity still comes from coal and this is a material that doesn't biodegrade. It's not going anywhere and the Trump administration got rid of the first ever federal regulations um, to address it, which only came into effect in 2015. So I think it's really important to pay attention to these things, even though they seem not only distant, but maybe boring, but they're not boring. I, I've got a couple more questions, and then I want to go to your questions. I understand you do a call out on Twitter, kind of challenging people to stump you, is that right? Oh, well, that was a, a joke. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but you can try. All right. <laughs> Um, we'll get to your questions in just a moment. Um, a core issue that you make and you've made it this evening is that we need to start paying the actual cost of our carbon emissions. What feasible system gets us to that? Um, well, I think a carbon tax is a, is a good place to start. I think also, um, you know, historically, we have, as, you know, as a global society, have not been able to decouple growth in GDP from growth in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and, and part of that is because people don't pay for the cost, but part of that, um, I mean, a lot of companies like in you know, the fashion industry in particular mark up their clothes by like the hundreds of times, um, but they can still be profitable even if they mark it up by six times. And so one of the questions that I often get asked is, um, you know, it's easy for, maybe it's easy for you to say that people should, you know, invest in clothes and wear them out, but that's not possible for everybody. Um, but I think if, <laughs> companies didn't necessarily feel that they needed to have these runaway profits and um, also not pay for the costs and also not produce clothes sustainably, but mainly not marking them up as much as they do. Clothing wouldn't have to be as expensive for everybody. So I think um, we also need to um, think about the true cost of things and how we measure economic growth because yeah, I mean, maybe GDP is growing, but also people are spending a lot more money on healthcare and um, you know, they're not e able to afford healthy food and they're not able to afford sustainable clothing. And that's, you know, if something's unsustainable, that means we can't sustain it. <laughs> so, you know, it won't always um, be this way. And we treat our resources as if they're, you know, limitless and, um, and that they'll never run out. But, you know, as, but we know that that's not true. So um, I think we need to have kind of, these companies really need to have more honest accounting. And if they're not going to do that on their own, that's why we really need better government regulation. Um, and so that's why the, you know, people ask me all the time, well, what's the one thing I can do, um, you know, to make a difference? And the, you know, that's to vote. Every day brings more dire news, both about the fact that our government in particular is retreating on any kind of thoughtful environmental policies, also information about the loss of birds in this country. Every day it seems there's something terrible out there. So how can we keep the reality of the dire situation in mind and not just become hopeless? Um, well, uh, it's not easy. Um, I think personally, you know, I, there have been a lot of books or in, and writing recently that has focused on trying to make people understand how scary this is, as if we, we didn't already know. I don't think fear is a powerful motivator. Um, I think it's more. Um, well, anyway, I, the gamble that I've taken in the way that I've written this book is that I think people want to be asked to help um, and people want to be asked to be involved. And, um, you know, there are things that we can all do, um, whether it's, you know, voting and getting involved in the political process or, you know, um, putting pressure on Amazon, whatever. And I think, you know, to feel that you are doing something, to feel that their change is possible, and it, it is, and um, I know that it often doesn't feel that way, but I... Um, you know, I think a lot about how, you know, I didn't know, I don't know what cities were like before the EPA existed, um, but, um, you know, looking at pictures, you can see, you know, brown smog covering LA, dirty water, dirty air, um, and, you know, if people hadn't protested in the 1970 election and defeated um, seven of the 12 members of Congress with the worst environmental records, we wouldn't have the clean uh, expansion of the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, and all, and all these other laws and regulations that I think many of us take for granted. So I feel like, um, you know, protest is powerful, civic action is powerful, um, government matters, and I think, I, I hope that, um, 
you know, t taking the example of kids like, you know, Greta Thunberg and the kids who are walking out of school in the climate strike, I mean, I think that that's incredibly inspiring. And the greatest variable in what happens to our planet is what we decide to do. And, um, you know, that we, we do have an opportunity to do something different. Uh, go to your questions right now. Do you have anything you'd like to follow up on or bring up some subjects that we did discuss? Would you like to try to stump touch you on that? You don't have to do that. That's fine. <laughs> we'll need the mic. Uh, we're recording it, so. Okay. The um, recent survey of practicing psychologists says that the most common cause of depression today is climate change anxiety. Don't you feel terribly guilty <laughs> building on that? No, I'm, help, I'm trying to help empower everybody to do something. I, um, no, I mean, I think that the, the tone that I've tried to write my book in and, and my message is I, I don't want to give anybody false hope or be you know, falsely optimistic because this is like this transforming our society to what will need to happen to reduce emissions by the amount we will need to reduce them is, is, will be incredibly hard. And we are seeing, you know, the effects of of climate change every day. And I, th so I think, you know, yeah, it's like incredible. I mean, if you think you're anxious and depressed about climate change, I have to read about it all day long, and then talk about it all day long. And all everybody wants me to do is make them feel better. So, um, so I get it. But <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know. I I guess I feel guilty, but um, I'm trying to do my best. Yes. What's your name and what's your question? Uh, my name is. Uh, my question is, um, I look at your references in here, and usually when a book comes out, of course, the references are already a little dated, yours are quite up to date, but nevertheless, uh, the information that's come out recently from the ITCC is really increasingly dire, and what we've heard is that that is really kind of a, a soft soaping, is that, that that IPCC report that mentioned time frames like 12 years is really, really generous. Um, I don't know that that's true. I mean, you know, the IPCC reports are the products of hundreds of the best scientists from all over the world. And so um, I think, you know, what, what they say, I mean, I think it's, it's not like that the deadline is 12 years. It's that if things don't happen by then, if we're not already making massive amounts of, pro of progress, you know, this, if things will get even worse. I think the thing that has been um, maybe uh, generous is that um, the kind of the two degree Celsius limit, because it will be incredibly difficult to stay with that. And also, there are lots of really terrible things that will happen. It's not as if we if we only um, if the average surface temperature of the Earth only warms by two degrees Celsius, like it'll be fine. It will be awful for millions and millions of people um, all over the world. So, um, you know, I tend to believe scientists, um, and you know, I, I mean, there are people who criticize the IPCC report as not being, um, you know, strong enough. There are people who say the opposite. So, um, so uh, you know, I, I tend to, you know, try to evaluate the research independently, but I'm not a climate scientist, so it can be hard to do that. Other questions? No, I've just got one. My name is uh, Dr. Kenneth Beck, and uh, I just one one question based on activism work so act. And that really inspires me, the idea to go on strike and to actually have a say in what happens to our environment and to the future generations and what they do. Um, so I guess my question is, there's one line at the end of the e-commerce part, and it's the last line, and I really like that, because it really portrays what has to happen. The problem isn't e-commerce necessarily. The problem may be us. Could you expand on that? <laughs> Yeah, I think, um, well, thank you for um, <laughs> quoting my work. Um, I, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think it's what I was talking about before, which is that the way that we use these things and the scale at which we use them is really part of the problem that, um, or the entire problem. You know, some of the um, innovations and um, disruptions or interventions really could make things, you know, more convenient, use less energy, use fewer resources, but we use them at such scale because they're so convenient that it cancels out kind of the efficiency gains. And I think, um, you know, for us in, in the US, um, we don't have to think about, or I mean, many of us, you know, 
we have the resources to be able to think of things as disposable, um, or you know, think of the, the, that the convenient thing is, well, if it's the best thing for us, then that's all that matters. Um, so I think, you know, question of you know consumption and, and resource use and convenience, and, you know, all these things, um, you know, fit together. And um, and, the, and I do think you know the way that we use our goods, the way that we treat them, is part, is if not the whole problem, then definitely part of it. Um, hi, my name is Heather Madsen, and I am a high school senior. I was just wondering, um, I'm an avid secondhand shopper, so I feel pretty good about my own actions, although I know that is not all I need to do. But I was really wondering about like the impacts of how much paper we all use, because I personally write a lot, and I just want to know how much that, like the production of paper, contributes to climate change. Um, well. That's a good question, and it's um, yeah. I should have mentioned before that buying um, secondhand clothing, vintage clothing, used clothing is um, the best way at the moment to shop sustainably, um, of, and renting clothes also. Um, paper production, I think, is you know one of the um, third or fourth biggest sources of industrial emissions. Um, so it is really significant, um, and you know the, the emissions come not only from land use changes from forestry to something else maybe but also from the production and pulping of paper so um, I don't know I don't know exactly what the impacts are um, and uh, you know everything has a trade-off so you know if you're using paper you're using that if you're using your computer you're using that so I think you know it's hard to say but I it's um, actually a really important thing maybe even more than paper for books is toilet paper and paper towels um, and we use lots and lots of trees to produce those um, you know, like virgin material, it doesn't necessarily need to be made from virgin material. Um, so, yeah, so it, it's a good question, and I, people have been asking me, you know, like, you say you care about climate, well, what about writing a book? Um, <laughs> so I, I get it, um, but uh, yeah, you know, I think it's impossible to make um, a choice that has no impact at all. You know, capital, capitalism doesn't allow for ethical consumption. Hi there, um, thanks so much for the talk. Um, uh, my name is Sean. Um, so far in my experience in the fashion industry, I'm most inspired by Eileen Fisher, Patagonia, and sort of all birds. Um, first question is like, who are you inspired by? And the second is just like, if you could touch on your, if you agree with Naomi Klein's critique of capitalism itself. Um, so I think those are great companies. I mean, I don't know as much about um, all birds, but I think I'm inspired by Stella McCartney's leadership. Um, I think she really does walk the walk on, I mean, um, in terms of trying to reduce her impact. So one example is her company, they found that um, cashmere had the biggest environmental impact of any of their materials, and so now they only use recycled cashmere or um, discards from other factories. And so, and she did that, you know, doesn't use um, fur or leather, and I think is trying to move away from using silk also. Um, so, so I am inspired by that. I think, I mean, I, I think she has said that she wishes she didn't have to be a leader, and I'm sure that's true for Patagonia and Eileen Fisher as well. You know, more people should be doing that, and then we wouldn't only have to be talking about Patagonia and Stella McCartney and Eileen Fisher. Um, can you um, t tell me what Naomi Klein's direct critique of capitalism is? I mean, I wish. I, <laughs> I, I came across it actually in. Um, Patagonia, Yvonne Chouinard's book um, about a lot of people surfing. Um, she wrote the beginning part of it, and she kind of just kind of poked a little bit at Patagonia, saying like, "Yeah, great that you guys make stuff, but the system itself is set up to incentivize profits over values." Um, so I don't know if you. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I agree with that, and I think I mean some of what I've been talking about tonight, hopefully. Um, betrays my feelings in, in that respect. And I, you know, the fact, our whole system relies on us consuming more. That's, you know, how companies, for the most part, make money. And so, um, so I think, and, and that means producing waste, and that means, um, you know, not only in the things that we throw away, but in producing the resources, in, or the goods in the first place. So um, I do think we have to, you know, I was saying before that it's, so far, we've not been able to decouple growth in GDP from growth in greenhouse gas emissions, and that maybe to address the climate crisis, we have to reevaluate what success looks like. 
Um, but you know, I do think that I was reading an interview recently in the New York Times with the former CEO of Unilever, um, and they made a uh, incredible effort towards sustainability under his leadership. And you know, he was saying that their profits grew enormously, while Kraft, which did the opposite, um, lost a lot of money. So I think it also companies should recognize that um, you know acting with the environment is not only the only option, but can also be good for business. Cool. Tatiana is willing to stick around if there's other questions that you have. The book is called Inconspicuous Consumption. And what's that Twitter handle? Uh, um, it's Tater Tatiana. Um, <laughs> so um, Ross is making fun of me about that, but I'm proud of it. Um, so anyway, Thank you. you can find me there. Thanks.